in a 100 mile running race, you have ups and downs. That absolutely is life. I look at my life, I always think about that. But you have to keep moving forward. And you can always move forward, and this too shall pass. Running, it's you put one foot in, the, in front of the other, and after a while, you don't even hear yourself breathe, you don't hear the steps on the trail, and you're just moving. Safety pins we need. I got safety pins right yeah, in the thing. You want me to grab some right yeah. now and put them in a little bag? These are all the reflectors. I'm going to take these big bands. Did you see the vests? I did. Yeah, you have to have shoes and socks. Elevation is not that high. I think the highest point is maybe 4,000, maybe 4,200 feet. However, on this race, there's a total 23,000 foot elevation gain and descent. So it's a lot of ups and downs. Puerto Rico is going to be the Toughest thing I've ever done. I'll be tougher than Ironman, tougher than Leadville, tougher than three-day race. This is the first self-supported race I've done, so where you basically crew yourself and you're moving along a course. The heat and the humidity definitely are gonna be very difficult. KT tape, I mean, I could narrow it down to about seven things, but we absolutely had to tape. Hey, he's still got This one, got blood. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's going to be perfect, Puerto Rico. This will be perfect. In the middle of the night, you're bringing them through. Yeah, we got to take this, too. I'll take it in my backpack. Puerto Rico, baby. Greatest place in the world. So I lived in Puerto Rico for six glorious years. Cut me here. I you know, bleed beans and rice and cut me over here and I bleed my fungo. We have Thanksgiving dinner right here on this beach. Thanksgiving dinner. This is what my youngest daughter, Sophia, made for me. And I'm not allowed to see this, but it's a folder. She told me there's different things here that it says, like if I'm having problems. So I'm gonna take this with me, and then it's gonna be the crew's responsibility to make sure they got the right one and read it to me for motivation. There's one other thing too that I'll take with me, and that's this right here, and I'll run with this the whole time. That's a picture of me and my kids together. And on the back, it says, my oldest daughter uh, drew that Hoana and that stitch, and that means uh, family. That means nobody's ever left behind or forgotten. So, anyway, they'll be with me the whole time.
Buenos dias. Let's see. Nervous, scared, excited, <clears throat> ready to go. Never done anything like this before, but it will be a great adventure. I gotta find people to call and stuff. I don't run really serious. In that pack, there's a package of salt in the front pocket. Can you give me that? It's in a little Ziploc bag. She's been my crew captain for all my races. And even when I was a little kid, she made all of my games or my wrestling matches or my track meets or my football games. And you know, she was always there in the stands. We went on to you know, do triathlons or races where you travel or you go on to these adventures. She's always been there. Now that we are doing, you know, like this Puerto Rico thing, this expedition where you're self-supported and there's nobody else that I'd rather have at my side. Well, I'm his mom, so he just asked me and I did it. I just make sure we're organized and uh, we're ready. He and I go over it before and he says, you know, at mile 30, I'll probably want a perpetuum and I'll want some salt. Or, and so I make sure that's ready. Here, let me have This will be different. This will be challenging. He will have a police escort in front of him. We'll be behind him. So me as a mother, I'll probably worry less because I'll know he's right there. That's disturbing too sometimes when he's doing a race and I don't know where he's at. Okay, Lato, you want Tina? Slow and steady does it. We're like at 13 miles and a little over two hours, you know? Yeah, slow down. I got an alien butt on, so I had to put on the knee brace. Only like 15 miles into it. Still got a ways to go. The 
just absorbing Charlie Ingalls' wisdom. Nice and slow. Nice and easy. <laughs> Suavemente. That's exactly right. Nice and easy does it. Here we go, one marathon now. Walk the hills. I think it's going to be really, really tough with the humidity and the temperature. I'm going to hand you all of these. Okay. Just take an image. We'll get it. Go out, Jay. We'll get it. Just leave it down. He was a young teenager. He would, it was his night blindness at first, and he would bump into things, couldn't see at night, and, um, and that's really how it started. And I was at a routine eye exam, eye and ear exam, with the nurse's office, and she says, you know, read that chart, I read the chart, and she says, you can't see, you know, you need to go to the doctor. So I go to an eye doctor, and the eye doctor, you know, is serious and says, you need to go and see a specialist. So me and my mom are like, well, you know, okay, we'll go see a specialist, but, you know, there's nothing wrong. So go see a specialist, dilates my eyes, looks in there, and, and uh, this one is 14, and sits me down and says, well, your retina is affected. You have retinized pigmentosa. I'd never heard of the term. You know, RP is the acronym it goes by. And I said, well, you know, what does that mean? He's like, well, what do you want to do when you get older? And my mom was a single mother, and neither my mother or father had ever went to college. And my mom had me and my brother um, programmed that we were going to college and getting graduate degrees. And I said, yeah, I'm going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And he, the doc, the specialist looks at me and says, well, forget about that. Uh, you're going to be blind by the time you're 30. You need to learn to do something with your hands. And 85% uh, you know, of blind people don't work, so you need to start preparing now. It's difficult, it's hard. But he handles it and, I mean, um, that's what it is and he's my baby boy, so, you know, he'll be 80 and I'll be 100 and <laughs> I'll still feel the same. I probably knew Jason for two or three years before I even knew that he even had an issue with his eyesight. But he ran pretty much right by me on the path. I said, hey, Jason, and he just, he, he was in his zone, but his, the tunnel vision effect or, you know, whatever it is, ex exactly, it, it, he didn't see me. He didn't see us standing there on the side, literally five to ten feet away from him. So that's when I was like, oh, okay, he, man, you know, he's, got, he's dealing with something a little more intense and, you know, and it's apparently getting worse, so... And that was several years ago, so I can only imagine now. You know, over the last five, six months, my eyes have been decreasing at a faster rate. Mentally, it's tough. I stopped driving three months ago, and that was a big, big change. I have, I'm a single dad, three kids, one with special needs. And when I was younger, I used to be able to see out here. And now as I look directly at you, with like with that eye, I don't see anything, see anything, and then I get an image right here. So what I have is I have, through that eye of that, and through my left eye, I have that. So I end up with tunnel vision right here. And I've been hit by cars. Six times I've been hit. Careful on this road, because people drive like maniacs. I'm going to stay right behind okay. you. Way to the right. Okay. I mean it. All right, give me a cup of ice, eh, Maxine? To put my hat. I have 2400 vision. When I was younger, I had like 2080 vision. So 2,400, what that means is what a person with 20-20 eyesight, you'll see at 400 feet, so you know, roughly a little bit longer than a football field, I would have to walk up to 20 feet to see that exact same size image. He's very self-reliant, he always has been. Even now, he'll run to work or bike to work. There's no asking for help or sympathy or anything like that. He's, uh, he's incredibly upbeat it does eventually rob you of your eyesight. He never allowed it to identify who he was as a human being. 
Rather, what he did was he used that experience to gain inner strength and inner power. I continued on with my life, and I did go on and you know, graduated with honors and got scholarships to college, a full ride to law school. I did go to law school, was a lawyer. For me, is because I don't see well, and you know, I go out there and there's cars and there's trees and there's everything else that I could trip on. So all these different perils that a lot of other people who I talk to think about when I go run. They're worried about me getting hit by a car, ran over, or run into the trees, or whatever. I mean, it happens. We all fall down. I'll, I will get back up. There's no question. I will run into a tree. I'll back up and I'll keep moving forward. Lock the park. Sunny San Juan, Puerto Rico. A little hot out here. Looking good, pace. You're doing good pacing, going drinking lots. Yeah. Are you peeing? You're not peeing, Jay. Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. You better start peeing. You can get nauseous, you can get... Uh, all sorts of things. But you gotta pee. Watch out, the monster will run you over. You're crazy. I've had a few close calls already. I know. Night running is probably one of the most difficult things in the world for me. At night, I think he gets down a little bit doing that race and it's harder. He loses a lot of time and I think that gets discouraging. I use a headlamp and it's a bright headlamp and basically illuminates about, you know, say a foot on the ground and that's what I see. And during the daytime, I don't see black with my tunnel vision. It's just like it doesn't exist. It's like it got cut out. Like the image just doesn't exist. At nighttime though, it's different. It's dark. So all that I see is bright right here. He's a good runner, but at nighttime, people pass him. He may fall. He does fall a lot. He just gets up and keeps going. But during the day, he passes and he's running at his optimum. At night, he slows down. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna need to get uh, my reflective stuff. We'll have to pull over. We get uh, the vest and the blinker, and then we have to get marine that too. Okay. When you're running with them, you just uh, just kind of listen to them, feel them out. Sometimes you're in front of them. I've put reflective bands or lights around my ankles or on my back or something, so he can see it. But if you're you know if you're four feet in front of him or five feet in front of him, hey, you know he needs he needs you at, at a certain distance. So he'll let me know when I'm too far ahead or too, or if I'm going too slow. I ended up pacing him for a little bit and uh, that's when I realized what he was dealing with with his vision. He didn't really elaborate much and but he just couldn't see and it was starting to get dark and we're going down a big mountain and I'm calling out every single rock and root and drop. I think running at night is a depressing time for him because I think he knows that you know that that's what his life may be at some point. And I think just generally, the thought that maybe someday this is really gonna be my life, you know, total lights out. Um, I think that maybe gets him down. 
And a lot of times during these night runs, when I first start at night, it's okay, I'm doing good. But after like 13 hours of being in the night and staring at this one little thing, yeah, I mean, it's difficult because I think your body starts playing with you, but it also always reminds me that it's it's gonna be dark. And I'm afraid of the dark. Um, and it's a, it's it's difficult. noticed also is when the dawn comes I start moving out of the pitch black when I look up and you start to see the beginnings of a blue sky just energized and I get an adrenaline rush kind of like right now just talking about it I just got a burst and I felt chills but it's helped me a lot during races and always helps get me through that second or third days the sunrises I really enjoy and I uh, have a, a tradition that I do now which is I play here comes the sun which is one of my daughter's favorite songs by the Beatles when uh, it's daylight and play that thing like crazy on my iPod. There's nothing like a dawn on a hundred mile line. They told me Luigi that put the police to the hospital. What? Sunday morning of the race, we'd been going for getting close to 24 hours. And the sun had come up and we'd begun moving again. Over the radio with my police escort, we were told that three of the runners had dropped. I mean, there were eight runners and three runners had dropped. I mean, at least two of the very strong runners, Charlie Engel, who's ran across the Sahara, and Luigi Desi, who's a race director and also Cross Island last year, dropped out. And that scared me because that made me realize that this was no joke and it was a serious endeavor. Although we kept going and were feeling good, we didn't know what was ahead of us and uh, realized that we really needed to stick to our game plan and, and uh, overcome obstacles as they presented themselves. Come on. That, that downhill's killed my leg. And this is just survival. I mean, this thing took half the competitors in the first 24 hours. Didn't you put 103, Puerto Rico 100 is done. I just gotta get to Puerto Rico 180. Uh, 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 Daddy, I'm missing a shoe. This in a shoe? I think there's shoes in the front. Is it your tennis shoes? Yeah. Grab me the crunch berry, will you? When I go out and uh, challenge myself to do something that I've never done before, I always have to deal with the fact that you don't know what's going to happen. 
although I train my body and I believe that I'm in physical shape, I don't really know what will happen. And, you know, I have three children. I'm a, a single father and they're my life. I always make a special effort on the night before or the last night that I have them to do something really special with them. I say until we meet again, whether that's take them to school or give them a kiss or just that hug. You want me to take her to school too? You're not going to have time to walk her and be back at 840. Yeah, we're going to walk. Meet, just meet me over at the school. Are you having first grade too? Yeah, yeah. Those are the best, the peanut butter. How yeah. did they go to the butter? Milk in there, champ? Cool. I'm getting milk. I fall and I'm walking in the milk. I said I thought you only had chocolate milk. Yeah. I got chocolate milk. You want that? We could walk this school. Why would we be able to? I don't know if I'm going to make the cutoff tomorrow. So every time that we stop, we got to do a quick thing. Otherwise, you're going to force me, you will force me to run. Not I could blow up tomorrow. So every moment counts. Bathroom breaks, everything. When you guys crew me, get out of the car, come back to me. Because these miles are like 16 minute miles. 17 minute miles sometimes in these mountains. My feet had been through a lot and it had been on all asphalt. So we had to find a solution. It was hot, uh, my feet were swelling, it was humid. We had to deal with the humidity and the heat and the swelling. There were blisters that were happening. What we decided to do was to do a stop and a full shoe change, sock change. And we ended up taping all of the toes and toenails, popping blisters, whatever was there. Hot spots, taping them, and then we also took a more dramatic approach as well. My stepfather used to cut off the toes of his shoes, I recalled, and I didn't have any shoes that were larger, so we got a razor and uh, some scissors, and we started cutting off the, the toe box of the shoe to be able to relieve pressure. And that actually ended up being a really good thing with the tape toes. It enabled it to breathe, so that helped prevent additional blistering. And also by taking off that toe box, it gave additional room for the feet that were swelling and took the pain away. Running is absolutely the metaphor for life. You have ups and downs. You have tremendous highs where you feel like, you know, you have an endorphin high, you could go forever. In the next moment, you've twisted an ankle or something happens and you've crashed but you have to keep moving forward. And that's life. I have these things that have happened in my life, things that happened in my childhood where you know they've been in the ditch. And then I keep going and then you know, 14, I'm diagnosed, I'm blind, I'm gonna go blind. Forget about your dreams, go in the ditch. The hardest part for me in my life to date has been when I went through my divorce. And there the reason was because I just had a family and all of a sudden it was gone. When you love your family and you're together, and then all of a sudden, half the time, you, know, you don't even see your kids and there's silence. I make the best of being a single parent that I can. I love my kids and uh, they're wonderful, wonderful kids. I spent a lot of time running and on the trails there. Running helped me a lot uh, during that time. And that's actually when I, that was the year that I first signed up for my first 100 miler. I got to mile 85. <laughs> so I did the Leadville 85 instead of the Leadville 100. There's always points in long races. You have to look at yourself and you have to look at yourself hard and say, it hurts. I want to quit. I can quit. There'd be no loss of pride with me pulling out because I've suffered, I've vomited. But do you quit or do you go on? Getting to that point in these long races is frankly what I love. And the part that I love is to push myself to get to that point. And then you figure out a way. 
you figure out a way to keep moving forward. And it may not be at the same pace. You may need to adjust your pace, but you will find a way. I took off because I was in so much pain I couldn't even take it <laughs> and then I did my mantra which is my scripture I recite you did your scripture yep and, and that was like, it it's a secret those mantra those who believe you shall soar on the wings of eagles shall run and not grow weary shall walk and not faint uh oh I think this is the sprinkling ravioli An internal reason for why I do these is because I feel a, a duty for my children to set examples of their father that frankly anything and everything is possible. I can't tell you how many times my kids hear other people tell me, uh, you know, that's impossible, you're crazy, or a person can't run for, for two days or three days or across an island, and my kids always say, no, it is possible. I am uh, really proud of all of my children, but one of my children in particular is my hero. That's my son, Sage. Uh, Sage has autism. And for him just to go out on a daily basis is a monumental effort. He goes out there with a smile and things are always gonna get tough for him. But he always overcomes whatever that adversity is. And sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes he does it in 15, 30 seconds. But he always ends the day laughing and smiling. You know, he shared how when they moved to Puerto Rico, they had just gotten their diagnosis. There was nothing there, and and uh, but that didn't stop them. He he went back to their company GE, and they helped him. And together, they they formed a, a school for children with autism. And Sage excelled, his son, and he and his wife at the time just they wouldn't give up, and and they they were relentless in creating something that would ultimately. Um, create success for their son. I have seen Sage um, from when I first met him to where he is today and, and I, would, I would say I attribute that young man's incredible growth because of the love and passion that Jason was instrumental in giving. We've been on the road. We've been on the expedition. Expedition Puerto Rico. That's how we'll make it. What I hope to do is to run a mile, walk a mile, run a mile, walk a mile, run a mile, walk a mile, run a mile, walk a mile. Let's see what happens. 33 more miles to go. Life's a great thing. You need to enjoy it. And if life's a race, I want to be dead last. Oh, Lincoln! Lincoln! <laughs> it's me bringing the cowbell. A lot of times people will 
tell you straight out that you can't do something. For instance, it might be that retinologist who originally diagnosed me so told me I couldn't be a doctor or a lawyer. Well, he was obviously wrong because I did. A lot of times they're talking about what their own perceptions of potential or possibility is. And what I've learned in life is that if you submit your own future and your possibility to what somebody else's opinion is, that's exactly what you're going to be. Those are the standards that you're going to achieve and that's the highest that you'll achieve. And maybe that's okay with you. But if it's not okay with you, then you have to define your own standards. And you have to look within yourself and you have to decide what am I capable of doing. When I hear the word can't or somebody tells me you can't do that or it can't be done. They've give, when they've given up before they've even tried. Nothing is impossible, absolutely nothing is impossible. And I think that's an important thing. You know, coming from you know, a middle-aged blind guy with skinny legs, going to Puerto Rico and running 180 miles, I guarantee if I listened to people, people tell me all the time, it's bad for your health, you're gonna die, you have three kids, you're blind, you're gonna get hit by a car, you could fall, well, that's true, all that stuff could happen. But in my mind, I sit here and I say, it's going to be so much fun and I can't wait. And I have determined for myself what is important to me and what my potential is. Just because somebody else tells you that it can't be done, you don't need to listen to that. What we should all listen to and be aware of when we hear those things is that that's a moment of adversity and in moments of adversity is when we need to get creative and that's when we need to have determination and perseverance that will overcome anything and everything intelligence alone can't overcome anything and everything education can't money can't none of that can but determination and perseverance just raw grit and guts and willpower can generally speaking get the job done, you just can't give up. across the island. We can go oh. put it where it goes. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Got it done. The Monster of the Caribbean. The hardest it. ultra in the world, I'd say.
like that. There's a toenail. One trophy. <laughs> yeah. Taylor, you're gonna have to have somebody else hold your camera. <laughs> Alright, trust somebody else. That's right, this is the